Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, Alib Byers, happy Monday. Hope you guys have had a really good day. Thanks for being patient for me to get this episode out. I know it's late, but it is really hard to cover a trial when they don't allow audio or video streaming. So I have to give a huge, huge thank you to Big E, Chasing Paper, 89 on Twitter. Go give him a follow. He is in the courtroom for Jake's testimony. He's giving me some notes. And we also had a very long conversation on the phone to fill in some of the gaps that he couldn't write fast enough for. So thank you to Eric. If it was not for him, we would not be able to dive deep into this testimony tonight like we're about to. Before we get started, big hello to all of our new followers. My social media has been crazy popping off with new followers all day. So welcome. We um, just, it's been mind blowing all day. Like I had to turn my alerts off, but anyway, so yeah, I hope you'll stick around. I love live covering trials. It's my jam. That's how I cut my true crime teeth about 10 years ago. First started out with the Jody Arias trial and kind of went from there and stopped a while and started back up again. So before we get started, I have to say a big thank you. Um, I went live on my road trip to see Stevie Nicks in Charlotte this weekend and some people popped on. And I have to say a big thank you to uh, Tina Marie, Eric, Biggie, Allison, and also to April for your donations. I really appreciate that. It keeps me uh, doing what I'm doing right here. So thank you very much. If you're new to the show, I always do a music fact of the day. I'm a music, just a music buff. Love it. Everything about music. I'm made of music. But tonight, my music fact of the day is I'm going to say Stevie Nicks is easily number two on my list of best concerts, only second to Pink Floyd in 1994 in Clemson, South Carolina. So that's my music fact of the day. We'll get back to the real ones tomorrow. So I put out a video earlier today uh, and also some posts saying that Billy had initially said that either they were going to have to kill Hannah Mae or Sophie. Now, I've talked to several people in the courtroom, and the way Jake said it, it did sound like that's what he meant. But everybody agrees that wasn't the case. It's just how he presented it. So I wanted to clear that up and uh, make sure you guys know that that just sort of came out wrong on Jake's end. So there you go. Um, so Eric said there was zero, zero emotion from Jake as he testified none whatsoever spoke very matter of fact about the about the murders as if he was just recalling some movie he watched so you know we learned a lot today i think for me that that surprised me Jake looked at George a lot according to Eric the jurors were very engaged in his testimony so um Jake was in a tan gel shirt and he had on glasses. His hair's long. It slicked back. And after he was seated, he looked right over at George. And this is the first time, remember, they've seen each other since they were arrested um, nearly four years ago. We're coming up on four years. Crazy to think it, but it's been that long. So they start out by talking about just sort of the family dynamics. And he said he was close to Angela closer to George and close ish to Billy him and George would go hunting. They would ride four wheelers fish together. And he said he loves George and he smiled when he said it. And he said, it's hard for him to be here. Uh, he said he loves his mom and dad as well. And he would like to see nothing more than for George to be able to go home. And Eric said, he also said as well as his whole family, but fat chance, buddy, it's what happens when you plan and execute a, a family of, of eight. He said hunting was kind of like a science project for George. He would study migration habits. He would plant foods that would attract deer. And if you remember, Chris Newcomb also testified to that as well. Jake said before all of this stuff started, he liked to go to festivals. He liked to work on cars. He liked to go hunting, that kind of thing. He did go to public school for about a month, but other than that, as we know, him and George were both homeschooled pretty much for their whole 
whole schooling years. He and George also went to technical school for a year. They talked about the dynamics of how they were a unit. As we know, and as we've heard, they shared finances. Each other would pay off the other's debt. It was kind of communal money. So nobody really had their own stuff. So the gun list found on Jake's phone actually was last modified in 2015, which was before the murders. And he talked about those family meetings and confirmed they took place in the kitchen. Most of the meetings, according to Jake, was about the efficiency of how the farm was running and just other general topics. And at the end of the meetings, he said he would voice his opinion and his vote. And the decisions depended on the topic. But if the topic had something to do with him specifically, then ultimately he had the final say. And that went for everybody in the house. So if the topic was about something relating to George, then George would have the final say. He talked about past crimes that him and his brother, George, and his dad, Billy, had committed together. So they would still fuel by setting up a pump. They would take fencing supplies, tools, lumber, appliances, building material, livestock. And Jake also learned how to pick locks, I guess, at a young age. I mean, nothing says bonding with your boys like teaching them how to commit felonies. They stole mostly from big companies since they were insured and it wouldn't be a loss as it would be to kind of the working man. And also it prevented people from getting hurt. And by people, I'm sure they probably meant themselves. They talked about hunting and he hunted with different people, but mostly George. He said two weeks out of the year, they did hunt with the rodents. And he admitted they did engage in poaching deer and they would do something that sounds really horrific. Oh, just so cruel called spotlighting where they would blind the deer with a bright light. And so the deer can't see you and it's frozen. And then he said it essentially keeps the deer from standing a chance against the gun. Chris Newcomb would also go with them to spotlight deer. They would hunt at Flying W Farms and places like that. He said, you know, obviously, as we know, they went mainly everywhere together as a family. He said personally he liked to shop at Walmart, Kroger, Cabela's, and especially Bass Pro Shops because he would get points back for his purchases there. He said he had a joint bank account with George but did not have one with Angela. And he said everybody used each other's accounts. So, again, just that pulling in the money and that nobody's independent at all. He said his very first interaction personally with the rodents was when he met Hannah May at the Pike County Fair back in 2010. She was in the 4-H tent area and she was 13 at the time jake was 17 she asked if he wanted to pet the little 4-h bunny and he said at first he ignored her and he started talking to samantha now if you remember samantha has already testified she dated frankie roden i think in middle school a little bit into high school and she had testified about how george was a nice guy and that kind of thing and but at that time she was dating frankie so he just started talking to Samantha, but eventually Samantha introduced him to Frankie and they started hanging out. And he said Hannah Mae at the time was just kind of a tag along and they would go fishing and they went several times with Hannah Mae going with them. And he also said that Billy and Chris were friends before he ever met Hannah Mae. And he later on asked Dana and Chris Sr.'s permission to date Hannah and so, as we've heard previously, Chris and Dana would pretty much demand that little Chris accompany Hannah Mae when she was with Jake, just to make sure things didn't happen. Unfortunately, later, um, oh, man, a domino of things happened. And uh, they would go four-wheeling. He said they would go to festivals. They would go see movies and just, you know, what sounds like kind of normal things, unless you're talking about a 13 and a 17-year-old being together, but... So she was 16 when she got pregnant with Sophia. Hannah Mae lived at the Bethel Hill Road address off and on while she was pregnant. It was a little more regular after Sophia was born. So Sophia was born on November 18th, 2013. Jake said at 2.30 in the afternoon. And he admitted to prosecutors that they had committed arson at that Bethel Hill house and that was their home of 20 years. Some of the belongings actually were taken to Chris Sr.'s and stored there, as well as some other locations. And he said they also burned a semi-truck back in 2016. 
Uh, the reason Peterson Road was put into Jake and George's name is because, number one, they had better credit, and number two, their insurance records were clear. As we know at this point, they, they you know, um, Angela and Billy had burnt down a bunch of stuff and, and gotten a bunch of insurance payouts. So then he was asked about the incident where he choked Hannah Mae. And this was kind of the breaking point, I think, in their relationship. He said she didn't want to do yard work that day, which he said ended up being cutting grass, which, which was something she chose to do as her chore. He said she was lazy in her responsibilities around the house and wanted to be on Facebook that day. And he said that made him mad because not only was he having to do his own work, he was having to pick up doing what she was supposed to be doing. So he said Hannah Mae was acting like Tabitha and he made clear he didn't like Tabitha. He said Tabitha had a bad attitude. So Hannah Mae stomped off and he said he didn't choke her, but he said he put his arm between her shoulder, kind of at her shoulder under her collarbone to hold her in place and calm her down. And when asked it, how, how, when asked, asked it lord have mercy y'all when asked how long he did that for he said around five minutes can you imagine being 16 years old and having a new baby and you're in a house where you're being controlled and then your boyfriend who is supposed to be loving you is pretty much choking you against a wall for five minutes it's just that, that poor girl um they broke up as we know in february of 2015 he said she initiated the breakup he did not want to break up he wanted to stay together as we know hannah may started dating charlie gilly and she got pregnant by him and eventually moved on to Corey holdren now jake had heard that Corey abused drugs and he actually met Corey at one of sophia's birthday parties so he had asked Samantha to keep tabs on Hannah Mae, and that was something that Savannah previously testified to when she was on the stand, and that he wanted to know when she was watching Sophia for Hannah Mae, and also just to let him know if, if, if she saw Hannah Mae up to no good stuff. If you remember, Samantha said she wasn't going to watch Sophia anymore because she, she didn't want to be in the middle of all their drama, and who would? Um, so then they start talking about why he became uncomfortable with Sophia being around Corey. And he said that Sophia had told him that Corey had locked her in a bedroom for sev several hours. And she cried for Hannah Mae, but nobody came to rescue her. She said she screamed for her daddy, which is Jake, obviously. He didn't come either. And when he was working, he said Hannah Mae would keep Sophia. And then when he was home, Sophia would come stay with him. He said Sophia would be filled with terror when he would go to take her back to Hannah Mae, saying that she would grab onto his leg and cry. And he asked Dana what might be going on with her. And according to Jake, he said that Dana said Sophia was being a brat and that Hannah Mae essentially said the same thing. So as we know, Angela was watching Tabitha's DMs to see if she was trying to get make any moves to get custody of Vine. And Angela saw, obviously, the direct message that Hannah Mae had sent saying they'd have to kill her first before she would ever sign over papers. So she told Jake about this privately when she read that message. He talked to a lawyer about getting custody, and Hannah Mae said she was also talking to her dad's attorney who was in Columbus, Ohio. Jake didn't believe her. He thought she was just kind of passing time, stalling him a bit. He said in the beginning, she was interested in signing papers, but as time went on, she was putting it off and she just wasn't for it. So they kind of moved to this newer motive that we really haven't heard. You know, we've heard for years that this was over custody and I think it kind of plays hand in hand with it. But he said he knew there was a history of rape in Angela's family, as well as Hannah Mae's and Tabitha's. And he was scared that Hannah would let Sophia be molested and he was worried because Hannah Mae was choosing to date men who were abusing drugs so at some point Hannah Mae's cousin I am not sure I can't remember what Eric said her first name was but it was a manly she got in touch with Jake and said that Hannah Mae had put Sophia to sleep in her room and Hannah Mae and Charlie locked the door for a long time and she knocked on the door and they wouldn't come to the door 
So he said really in late 2015, early 2016, he became really concerned that Sophia either had been molested or was going to be. He said initially Billy suggested that they kill Hannah Mae. This is where Jake said that, that confused several people in there. I've talked to uh, not only spectators, but a couple of media people as well. And they sort of thought he insinuated the same thing. But he was saying that Hannah Mae needed to be killed before anything happened because if something wasn't done he thought the same as jake that something would end up happening to sophia initially jake was not on board with the idea he said because hannah may was sophia's mother so he discussed his concerns with hannah may about sophia being molested and he said the two of them began to argue and she allegedly said if Sophia were would have been molested, they would just have to deal with it. And Jake said she wasn't taking his concern seriously. And he said that was kind of the moment that was what he called his tipping point. And he knew that he would have to kill her. So he said it was a month or two between Billy initially suggesting it and him actually agreeing. I don't know how much I believe that Billy suggested it. Jake was very much a mama's boy. And I think he probably still is at heart, even though he hasn't seen her in four years now, nearly. But I don't know. I just kind of still think Angela probably came up with this whole idea herself. I, You know, he was close-ish to Billy. Just remember that. So, um, at first Jake suggested maybe they would stage it to look like a murder suicide and to make it look like Corey had done that to Hannah Mae and then taken his own life. But Billy said that really wouldn't work. And when they got to talking about killing Hannah Mae, he said they would have to kill all of them because if Hannah Mae were murdered and the suspicion fell on Jake, that, uh, Kenneth, Frankie and Chris senior would come after you. And Jake said, Billy said they would come after you like a sniper on a hill. And so they, they knew that that Hannah Mae, Kenneth, Frankie and Chris senior are, were the intended targets, but they knew with Gary possibly being there, which they did not know for sure he would be there that night when they left to do the murders, by the way. Um, but he, they knew that little Chris, Dana, and possibly Hannah Hazel would be potential witnesses. So if they were in the house, they would have to be killed as well. And Billy told Jake that him and Chris had a bond that was better than brothers. And it hurt Billy to say that Chris Sr. would have to die, but I don't believe it. Uh, he also knew that... Have, that um, Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. I just jumped ahead like three paragraphs. Billy said he would take care of the timing and the events surrounding the actual murders, and he wanted to do it on a cloudy night. He was the one that chose the actual day. So Jake's job was to get all the firearms and the silencers built that they would use in those murders. So they went over the purchases that Jake had made for the murders and kind of he told who bought what. And then he walked through how he built those silencers. And Jake said initially his weapon of choice for the murders was a Ruger 1022, the SKS for George, and then Billy would take a Beretta 92. But the silencer for the Ruger didn't work, and the silencer actually broke the barrel off and it made it unusable. So what happened was Jake had bought some flashlights off of Amazon, and one of those was a generic brand. And the other was a mag light. But the generic's flashlight, the aluminum was just way too thin. So with Billy's uh, Beretta, they tried the mag light flashlight to make the silencer, but it, it just didn't work. So they burned the mag light. He says other items used to make the silencers were thrown in a dumpster, which I know that they pulled that one mag light out of the uh, cistern. But Jake said they decided the best way ultimately to make the silencers would be to use the oil filters. So in March of 2016, Jake got the freeze plugs for that baffling system. We talked about this on previous episodes where if that baffling system was off and the bullet struck it, it could skew the bullet and cause problems. But the drill bits he bought were the actual sizes as the bullets and the tap and dies as well. Jake decided to take the Walther Colt 1911, which Billy actually gave to him, and Billy decided to take the Glock. 
and they welded the oil filter to the SKS and the 1911. He said that George was there when they bought the truck that was purchased specifically for those murders. This was three weeks prior, and it happened in their driveway. It was a GMC, and it was purchased for somewhere between $1,500 to $2,000 from his uncle Todd. There was another Uncle Gus there, and that was, again, at Peterson Road. It, the model of the truck was late 90s or early 2000 model. October is National Eczema Awareness Month. According to the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, while it's usually thought of as a childhood disease, around 16.5 million adults in the U.S. have eczema. And while it affects people in various ways, 51.3% of adults with atopic dermatitis say it limits their lifestyle. 39% say it causes them to avoid social interactions because of their appearance, and 43% say it affects their activities. Luckily, as you know, Glad Skin is here to help. But what actually causes the itchiness, redness, inflammation, and discomfort in the skin is a disruption of the bacterial environment, also called the skin microbiome. GladSkin specifically works to target the imbalance in your skin's microbiome. But unlike other skin brands and prescription medications, GladSkin uses MicroBalance, a revolutionary protein that restores the balance of the good and bad bacteria that live on your skin so it can finally heal. Is so effective that 91% of users, adults and children, who tried their top-selling eczema cream reported significant improvement after just seven days. GladSkin with MicroBalance is steroid-free, works without harsh ingredients, and is clinically proven to reduce eczema symptoms. It's even gentle enough for babies. So, if you've been frustrated with your treatment options, don't wait to try GladSkin. They're offering my listeners 15% off plus free shipping on your first order at gladskin.com slash what the world. That's gladskin.com slash what the world for 15% off plus free shipping. Gladskin.com slash what the world. Jake said it was actually Billy's idea to modify the bed of the trunk. And Jake talks about him and George building that raised bed where they took a two by four and then they screwed plywood into it so that it caused a lift where they could hide underneath. And then they put hay on top to make it look like they were just hauling farm stuff they needed. And that was actually built behind the new barn, which at that point did not have the stalls, only the posts. And once the platform was built, they put the hay on and that was how they were going to be undetected. Jake said they bought the signal jammers to prevent anybody in the rodent households from calling 911. He thinks the phone jammers was Billy's idea. They actually tested it at Peterson Road, and it did work. Jake said he told Angela to buy two pair of ugly tennis shoes. One reason, I think, is because they've all said that the boys only wore boots, and Jake kind of wore a little more hip clothes, I guess you could say, like um, stuff you'd find in them all like Air Apostle or um, American Eagle to wear. I think George and Billy are definitely a kind of car Carhartt guys. Um he said that they were all in the truck at Walmart, as we kind of suspected when she bought them. And he bought that CCTV set that had the DVR from Walmart. They bought that purchase plan. And he also bought that bug detector. He said that himself, along with George and Angela, did the custody documents. And Angela was the one that forged Hannah Mae's signature. This was done in the event either or both of them were killed the night of the murders to ensure that Angela would receive custody of Sophia and Vine. And knowing Hannah Mae was pregnant, they decided to wait until after she gave birth to do the murders. Oh, man. And um, he admits that they dyed their hair dark. Jake said he wanted to look like Daryl, who's played by Norman Reedus from The Walking Dead. He has got a major man crush on him, y'all. Um, they start talking about the night of the murders and he, he, he confirms the entire family knew of the plan and Billy told them that this day was it. Billy came in the afternoon and said, tonight's the night we're going to do it. He admitted to watching the boondock saints clip to pump himself up to get the guts for, he said to do what he was going to do. So they again played the ding dong scene. Now, according to somebody in the courtroom, he was kind of trying not to laugh watching this, this scene in this movie. Angela was at home and was going to be browsing on Facebook with Jake's phone to make it look like he was at Peterson Road at the time of the murders. 
Now, Billy's Glock was kind of a last minute decision and it didn't have a silencer. So before they left, they went into a cabin that was about 50 feet from the house and shot it while Billy was inside the actual house. And he said he could not hear it. So he decided to take that clock that night. Kanepa asked if George went with him and Billy intending to murder someone that night, essentially. And Jake said yes. Jake said that he himself wore black clothes that were baggy. George wore a ski mask. Um, Jake wore a ski mask. He said that George's clothes were dark. The gloves were just kind of the cheap uh, cloth pair that you get for like a buck. And he said what he calls the ugly Walmart shoes. Billy wore a hoodie and uh, Eric said he really didn't remember if Jake knew of anything else Billy was wearing. He said he walked with his bare feet to the truck to avoid any dirt from Peterson Road being transferred to the crime scene. And they left the house around 9 p.m. They got into the, the bed of that truck feet first. So Billy was the one who obviously drove to Chris Sr.'s while George and Jake were hiding in that bed of the truck. Billy gets out. Less than 10 minutes later, Billy comes back, lowered the gate of the truck down, and told them to wait for his signal, which was when he would be walking back from the grow. Now, they, like I said, they didn't know for sure that Gary would be there that night, but when they got there, Gary's there. They know Gary's got to be killed, too. So Jake and George get underneath the truck. And I'm going to put this up on screen. If you're new to this and you're only listening to the podcast version, I will put a link in the description showing the pictures that I show on the YouTube version of this. So on the screen here, we have a picture of the SKS. That, I believe, is not the original one, but it was what George had that night. So these are the two murder weapons that were used, the Glock and the SKS. Chris Sr. and Gary were crime scene one. And if you look at the pictures on the left, I've got an arrow on the bottom. It shows the projection of the bullets so you can kind of see where on the property they were hiding underneath that truck. So uh, Jake was positioned at the left front tire and George was at the rear tire. The plan for walking back was that Chris would be walking first, Gary second, and then Billy last. When Chris got up on the porch, that was kind of the cue for when George was supposed to take that shot at Chris Sr. So then Jake goes on to describe what happened when Chris Sr. was murdered. So Billy, Chris Sr., and Gary walked out of the shed outside of his house to where the marijuana was being grown. Jake was on his stomach. George had the SKS rifle, and Jake as they're walking back, told George to shoot. But he said George froze, could not do it. So, as we know, Billy used that lost phone excuse and walked out to them and asked why George didn't take the shot. Jake said George wouldn't do it. So, Billy went back inside Chris's house with Gary and Chris Sr. Jake heard Billy ask Chris Sr. to call his phone again. So, Chris eventually comes back to the door and Jake said he got to where George was laying and took the SKS and shot at him. But the, he was aiming for Chris Sr.'s head. And he said that way it would be instant. And he missed the first time and panicked. By the time he was firing the second shot, he said he had his eyes closed and just was aiming toward Chris Sr.'s midsection. He heard two gunshots from inside Chris Sr.'s house. He said to him it sounded like a hammer hitting wood really hard. Then he saw Billy running outside having what Jake calls a nervous breakdown. And Jake said he told Billy it was too late to break down and told him he needed to calm himself down. And he said it took about five minutes for Billy to calm down. I've always said Billy was not freaking out about killing his friend Chris or Gary. He was probably freaking out because Jake was spraying bullets all in the house. And Billy knew what was whizzing past his head. He was not sad about killing his friend. He was freaking out because he about met the same fate he afforded eight human beings that night, I think. So as, after Chris Sr. was and, and Gary were murdered, Jake went inside and took the keys to the grow house, which were in Chris Sr.'s front pocket, to get the surveillance DVR. He threw that into the truck. Then Jake goes back inside Chris Sr.'s house and said he saw the bloody drag marks and the bodies of Chris Sr. and Gary that had been pulled into that bedroom area. 
He said he pulled the blanket off of Chris Sr.'s bed and covered them up, but he says he doesn't know why he did. He took their cell phones, which were in their pockets, and he tried to wipe blood up with a rat with a rug and walked out. He met Billy and George at the truck, and at this point, he said Billy had calmed down a lot. The phone jammer's battery died way sooner than they thought, actually before they even left Chris Sr. So as we know, Chris Sr. had the most shots of anybody, which was eight gunshot wounds, and Gary had four. So next, they walk over to Frankie's house, and he had the doors locked, and Jake thought they may have to kick in the door. So then at this point, they decide to take Chris Sr.'s truck to do a drive-by at Dana's house, which is where Hannah Mae and little Chris and Kylie Mae, the brand new five-day-old newborn, were to see if she was home from work yet, and she wasn't. After that, they drove to Kenneth and saw that he was at home. Now, he opened Chris Sr.'s flip phone to check the time, and he wasn't sure if he checked it the first time they went to Kenneth or the second, but he said he thinks it was 3 a.m. when he opened that phone, so that would have been that first trip because we know Dana's uh, – Dana and Hannah Mann and little Chris weren't mur murdered until after three and Kenneth was the last. So from Kenneth, after they went to see if he was home, they went back to Chris seniors and left Chris seniors truck there. The reason they took Chris seniors truck is so it wouldn't look super suspicious if Chris seniors truck pulled into Dana's house or even Kenneth's. So they walked back over to Frankie's and the back door was locked. Jake tried to open the door with a hunting knife that he had brought along, but it broke off the tip. So he found an open window, and you can see that here in this picture, and climbed in. He then let George and Billy inside by just unlocking the door. When he's walking through the trailer, he sees Frankie's son, Brentley, asleep on the couch. Now, we know Jake initially said in his proffer that he was worried Brentley might recognize him because he had been around Brentley. But he eventually goes to Frankie's room. He notices Hannah Hazel was there, so he shot Frankie, and that caused Hannah Hazel to start stirring around. So as he's leaning over to shoot Hannah Hazel, he noticed that Ruger was in between Hannah Hazel and Frankie, and he shot Hannah Hazel five times in the head and Frankie twice. And I've always wondered why Hannah Hazel got the second largest number of gunshot wounds. And I don't know if it's subconscious because her brother is the man who Hannah may had just had a baby with. I don't know why, but it seems to me like she would be kind of, you know, in the past, I hate to use this word, but collateral damage because she was just there. He said he wanted to use the 22 because he thought it would be quieter, but he also thought that the firing pin on the, the Colt 1911 would be harder to match due to how unique the markings are when that is fired. And that's true because if you remember the guy from BCI, Epic Beard Dude, had to consult uh, the manufacturer of the, the weapon in Germany as well as ask another BCI agent who had a similar gun to confirm about the, the marks left on that. So from there, they go back to Chris Sr.'s in the truck and, and get in his truck. They drive over to Dana's. They confirm Dana's home, Hannah Mae, and little Chris are inside. George and Billy came inside as well. Jake still had his mask on. The door was unlocked. By the way, he said Billy did not wear a mask. George did. Dana was still awake and was on her cell phone when he was in the hallway, and he said she was propped up on her pillow. While in the hallway, Jake said he froze, and the newborn, Kylie, started to cry. He saw Hannah Mae was getting onto her left side to nurse the baby, and she was kind of raised up on her elbow. As soon as Kylie started crying, Dana turned towards the hallway and saw Jake and kind of let out a gasp. So he shot her from the hallway in the head. He said he spun around and went back to where he was standing. And Hannah Mae turned and saw him, so she kind of leaned on her right elbow and 
Of course, Jake had the mask on in his proffer. He said he did not think that she recognized him, but clearly either she heard the, the shot or her mom gasp or both. So Hannah Mae did not gasp, but he said she inhaled kind of a, a shocked inhale like you would do. And he shot her in the hair in the head. From there, he went back across the hall to Dana's room and she was making noises. He said she was moaning. So he shot her again. And he said he remembers shooting her in the neck and he, he said it was point blank. Now, remember the gun expert said that because these silencers were homemade and not professionally made, that if they're off, it can cause the soot to gather and the gunpowder to gather at the very tip of where the bullet comes out. So the gun expert said that could make it hard to determine the distance at which somebody was shot at. And that kind of makes sense according to some of Jake's testimony that we're hearing today. And so um, if he did not put the pillow over Dana's face, he says, and he did not cover her up. He went back to Hannah May's room and he shot her again because he said he did not see an entry wound. At that point, with the second shot, she slid off the bed. So he said he kind of propped her back on her side and he said, I know this won't make sense, but he said he did this so the newborn could nurse in case it took a long time for someone to find the bodies and he didn't want the baby to starve to death. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is just some disturbing stuff. And uh, I, I, from what I've heard about his demeanor today, just matter-of-factly talking about this as if it's nothing. And then you think about what he's testifying to with zero emotion. There are no words to describe what is up with this guy it is evil to the core all of them all four of them knowing what they were going to do and knowing that they were going to take a mother away from two babies and not only that but look what they took away from the babies they took an entire side of family a whole generation gone and so from Hannah May's room when he gave the second shot. He went into little Chris's room and he said that little Chris was asleep. Jake said he walked to the left side of the bed and shot him and little Chris was making a noise. So he shot him again, point blank in the head and he got their cell phones. He said Dana was on Facebook when she was murdered because he looked at her phone when he picked it up. He also went uh, room to room picking up the shell casings and he thinks he locked the door on the way out. So we know Dana had four shots to the head. Hannah May had two. Little Chris was shot four times in the head. At this point, the three of them drove over to Kenneth's, and George was driving their personal truck that they had bought for the murders. Jake and Billy were in Chris Sr.'s truck. Billy was the passenger. George pulled over in a driveway about a mile away from Kenneth's house, and Jake drove Billy up to Kenneth's trailer. So Billy just proceeded to go bang on the door loudly and nobody came. So we know that Kenneth did not lock the door. He didn't have a locking mechanism from inside. He had that padlock on the outside. And he also had that little sensor. If you look here in the very center top picture, he had that little sensor at the end of the driveway that would make an audible sound when somebody was driving up. But we also remember his son and daughter both testified if he had taken his blood pressure medicine, he tended to be a very heavy sleeper. So I, I'm assuming between the banging and not hearing that sensor go off, that was the case that night. So he walked in the house. Jake said he saw the flash of a muzzle and they left the scene. We know Kenneth had one gunshot wound to the eye. They drove back to Chris Sr.'s house. They left the truck. He locked the door to Chris's house, tossed the keys inside, and shut the door. They went back to Peterson Road and got back home around 4 a.m. 
that was where things left off for the day. But one thing I'm trying to keep it in chronological order. One thing that was testified to early on, if you remember Chris Newcomb testifying about that really bad wreck that he was in with Jake, where it took four hours for Chris Newcomb, who is Angela's much younger, 20 years younger, half brother, uh, to get him out with the jaws of life that he nearly died and had to be airlifted. Check this out. It was intentional for the insurance money to pay the loan off because the engine repairs that were needed on that truck were too expensive. Not only that, Jake volunteered to wreck it. And according to Jake, Chris Newcomb knew the wreck was going to happen and went with him. So I was thinking about this. It makes a lot of sense now when Chris was on the stand and asked if that wreck was intentional. Chris said, not on my part. Now it fits. So that's where we left off today. I, uh, you know, God willing, Eric will be back in the courtroom tomorrow and we will get these notes and do this again tomorrow evening. So just again, a big welcome to all you new listeners. And uh, hopefully tomorrow he's still on direct exam. He is not up on cross exam. This is the one time I'm rooting so hard for Nash and Parker to just eviscerate him on the stand. I've never rooted for these guys once for anybody on the stand. To, whenever he comes up for cross-exam, it is going to be vicious. And George looked really nervous, y'all. It's When, when uh, Jake first came in, he didn't look up. And then he looked up. And then you saw him look up a little bit more. But he was fidgety and twitchy to me. He was doing something funky with his mouth. I don't know if he was trying not to cry or what, but whatever. They all deserve to be where they are and anyway so just some really interesting stuff i think that the revelation that according to jake this was more about the concerns of the of alleged uh prior or potential uh sexual abuse of sophia was the main motive and not custody although it went hand in hand that was just something that surprised me now i wonder Honestly, is Jake living up to his end of the bargain for testifying? Because according to Eric, he said it sounded like he had very selective memory when it came to George. And whether that's he's given prosecutors one side or actually seeing his brother today made him sort of have second thoughts about implicating him any more than he had to. Who knows? But we will see. Anyways, all right, I'll be back tomorrow night. Same routine. We'll cover day two. And uh, all right, we'll catch you tomorrow, Tuesday. All right, have a good one.